four days out from the 2020 U.S. presidential election, the incumbent, Donald J. Trump, and the Democratic challenger, Joe Biden. Now, in past programs, we tried to show you some things that we think you should be looking for, things that maybe aren't appearing in the mainstream analysis, but are definitely moving the dial, especially in some of the key swing states. We'll show you a couple of updates from some key swing states, especially court rulings on the late ballot submissions. We'll look at something that's just happened recently on that regarding the Supreme Court. We'll get into that. And we'll also be looking at other trends and other things that we think are gonna be definitely influencing in the last four days of this election stretch. Now, one of the things that uh, we're looking for as well in terms of polls, not necessarily mainstream opinion polls or national polls, but sort of qualitative polls, things that are showing important trends going against national opinion polls. Here's one Gallup poll. This was actually from a few weeks ago, but this is really important. 56% of Americans say that they're better off now uh, than in 2016. And this is, mind you, during the, quote, pandemic, uh, during sort of the economic devastation of the COVID lockdown. So uh, if you look at an opinion poll like this, it, it generally bodes well uh, for the incumbent. So that's something that we thought was kind of interesting. And here's something else. We talked earlier about this uh, phenomenon of shy Trump voters. And here's one. This is from the People's Pundit, uh, who we follow on Twitter and who you should too in terms of getting really good, high quality data. They're saying here one in five suburban voters in a key swing state of Michigan are, quote, uncomfortable sharing their political beliefs or voting intentions. Now, we told you that the, in terms of the shy Trump voter, in other words, they they're, they're talking to mainstream pollers, they're talking to telephone pollers, and they won't let in that they're you know, going to vote for Donald Trump. So they either say they're voting for Biden or say they're undecided or they're voting for a third party candidate. And those numbers can be as high as 50% 50, 50 according to some studies in certain areas. So, I mean, this is just more evidence. Now looking at Michigan, if that's the case, then yes, the mainstream polling will be off, off enough by what might be the likely margin of victory uh, in a very close, tight battle. Mind you, in 2016, this was, I believe, decided on less than 1% of voters. So when you see an anomaly like this, the, uh, the shy Trumpers, hashtag shy Trumpers, it could make a massive difference uh, in terms of the final results. So that's one of the things that you should be looking at as well when you're sort of making your calculus of what's likely to happen on November 3rd. Now, this is interesting here, and we, we're going to look at some battleground states, but we're going to look at them in a, in a certain way. There's been some legal challenges uh, regarding the late ballot submissions, and this has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. It has massive ramifications. So in terms of key battleground states where this is in play, let's look at one of them right now. Uh, probably the biggest one is Pennsylvania. Let's just do a little recap on where we were at in Pennsylvania. Uh, we said earlier in the first program that this is a, a COVID lockdown blowback potential situation here. There was a court ruling against lockdown in September. So again, we, we identified earlier that this trend meant that Donald Trump is definitely riding the wave of anti-lockdown sentiment. Also, the Reagan Democrats in this state. So potentially this could swing in the direction of the GOP in 2020. And also we noted the southwest part of the state, that's a red firewall that stretches between West Virginia, Ohio, and the southwestern districts of Pennsylvania. Very important uh, Republican stripe there across this area of the country. Scranton's forgotten son, Joe Biden, fracked off by Dems over his comments on fracking and basically on the energy industry. So that was something we identified uh, two weeks ago. Now here's Trump in 2016, won by the slimmest of margins, 0.72%. He's looking to build on that. We said that it's very possible that he might. And we also looked at the Indy voter void uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. Indy votes were big in 2016, 2.4%. What's gonna fill that void in a close race? That could make all the difference dark matter, uh, new GOP voters. There seems to be a surge of new Republican registered voters in the state of Pennsylvania. That definitely bodes well for Donald Trump. Uh, potentially that could extend uh, a lead, uh, any perceived lead that Trump might have going in. That's definitely a big omen there. So we gave the edge to Trump uh, on that. Now let's look at some of the updates. What's happened since uh, in Pennsylvania? Let's take another look at it. 
And Biden's energy gaffe, uh, if you noticed in previous statements in the last week, he says we're going to end oil consumption, basically, in America. Now, this apparently has made a big impact uh, on a lot of voters in this state. So that could be a, a major gaffe by Joe Biden there. So definitely, once again, he's fracked off by Dems on this. And there was rioting in the city of Philadelphia just in the last 24 hours, uh, over uh, apparently over police shooting. Uh, Walmart has been sacked. Uh, look at this footage right here. So this could definitely work in Trump's favor uh, so close to the election. I mean, people are seeing uh, rioting, they're seeing looting and things like this. So uh, this is definitely something that maybe it played well uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident with mainstream media, with, with Democrats who saw that as their vanguard uh, at the time. But you know, closer to the election day, these sort of scenes, like we're seeing in Philadelphia, this could definitely work in Trump's favor in such a tight, uh, close race in Pennsylvania. So the Supreme Court Democrat uh, request for a ballot extension or late voting under the pretext of the pandemic. And this is what we're gonna take a closer look at right now uh, in terms of what's going on in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. This article appeared here in the New York Times. This was a major story in the last 24 hours. The Supreme Court allows longer deadlines for absentee ballots or mail-in votes in the state of Pennsylvania and also North Carolina. And just to break this down, what does it mean? These two cases involved broadly similar issues in these two different states. Let's look at Pennsylvania first. In Pennsylvania, uh, the question was whether the state Supreme Court could override voting rules set by the state's legislature. That's the big question in Pennsylvania. And in North Carolina, the question is whether the state election officials had the power to alter such voting rules. So similar cases, but two different approaches here. And what does this mean in terms of both of these states and where they'll be at uh, in a few days? Well, let's first look at Pennsylvania again. Uh, in terms of Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court of the United States upholds a state court who ruled that ballots can be received up to three days after Election Day on November 3rd. And then further to that, Justice Barrett actually sat out this decision. She said that she didn't have enough time to review uh, the case. So the, uh, the ACB effect uh, wasn't in play in this situation. Uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, she was just sworn in as a Supreme Court Justice, and she wasn't able uh, to intervene on this. And so not only that, but as you'll see later, the court itself doesn't, apparently didn't have time uh, to review this properly. So this is uh, something potentially very controversial. Let's look at what else they said here. Uh, in terms of Justice Alito here, conservative justice, uh, the state court of Pennsylvania has violated the U.S. Constitution. Uh, they cannot override the state legislature. So the argument here is a constitutional argument, and that's that the state legislature reserves the rights and the powers to determine how elections are conducted. And what they, what they are saying here is that partisans have basically petitioned the state court uh, to sort of override what are the normal election rules uh, in the state under the color of COVID-19 or the quote pandemic. So they, they're claiming that people need more time to vote because of the pandemic and they're alleging that there's chaos in the U.S. Postal Service and that votes can't be delivered on time and so forth. And that's probably, uh, it's debatable whether that's actually true or not. And so this is where the argument sits. Unfortunately, it's happening at the last minute. Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch uh, to conservative justice here say the court may return to rule after election day in order to review properly. In other words, with a little more time, uh, they'll be able to review this a bit more. And so you could have a very strange situation where a decision on this may be rendered after uh, election day. So what the state are doing is segregating the ballots. So anything that's received um, you know, after election day, up to that three-day period is going to be segregated. Obviously, anything that is received after that is going to be either segregated or discarded. So, and they might, you know, add up the tally on these votes to see if they would have actually made a difference one way or another. In other words, the election could be decided already uh, on November 3rd. So you could have a situation potentially here. There's going to be pressure put on Pennsylvania not to declare a result on election night. Uh, we're, we're saying it's coming. We're saying the Democrats are, have definitely put this in as an absolute strategy uh, on November 3rd. This is above and beyond any presidential run by Joe Biden. This is a party strategy uh, in order to hold up 
calling uh, a key swing state like Pennsylvania. Now let's move on here and look at another state. This is North Carolina. Now, a, a, in the last program, we talked about this, where North Carolina Republicans tried to block a mail-in ballot deadline extension proposal. And so the Supreme Court apparently has weighed in on this as well. Back to the New York Times here. Let's look at what happened. The Supreme Court of the United States let, let stand the lower court ruling that allowed the state's Board of Elections to extend the deadline to nine days uh, after Election Day. That's up the uh, up from the three days called for uh, by the state legislature. So, you know, extending it from three days to nine days. So uh, potential for chaos, possibly. Let's look at what else they say here. This is Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. And what they've said uh, is that they would have granted requests from the Republican lawmakers and the Trump campaign to block this lower court ruling if they had more time. So you can see this is also a last minute uh, game of chess here uh, by Democratic activists, the Democratic Party against the Republicans. So the Democrats want a longer a sort of uh, extended deadline to vote. The Republicans are saying, let's stick to the rules. Uh, we don't need special dispensation because of COVID-19. And we talked about even some states like South Carolina saying that uh, people shouldn't have to uh, sign their ballots or this, having the signatures match uh, shouldn't be uh, an issue uh, and supposedly because of COVID. And Republicans are pushing back on this saying, hey, this is the easiest way to commit voter fraud. Uh, by forging signatures on ballots. So you can see that they're really clashing both parties. The Democrats seem very desperate to uh, get rid of all of the uh, election rules and regulations that were in place and saying that because of COVID-19 uh, that we need some you know, more loose rules and you know, extend deadlines and not require signatures. It's a very strange strategy, but nonetheless, this is what the Democrats uh, are going with here. Now, here's the big question is, is it going to make a difference? And look at some of the early voting statistics. Now, this is a, a recent poll here as of October 23rd. Let's take a look at a couple of states here and see what's happening. Now, this is party affiliation by state in terms of early voting. Michigan, 41% Republican, 39% uh, Democrat. Okay, so good turnout uh, in terms of uh, Republicans in Michigan, Pennsylvania, 71% Democrat, 20% Republican, North Carolina, 40% Democrat, 30% Republican, Wisconsin, 42% Republican, 36% Democrat. And let's look at Texas. That's obviously a big state. Republicans have the edge there. And early voting, 53% Republican, 37% Democrat. Now, why is this important? Take a look at the statistic. If you're worried about a, a late ballot surge, uh, which really is what we're looking at in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Well, let's take a closer look there. I mean, in terms of this, are the Democrats really going to deliver a late ballot surge or are, has it already arrived? We talked about this with regards to Florida. The Democrats ha had done their early vote surge in Florida, and maybe they won't have much left uh, in terms of on, on the election day in terms of in-person voting. And so certainly in terms of early voting here or postal voting maybe, uh, is, this, is this indicative of the fact that the Democrats, a lot of their votes are already in right now in terms of early voting? That's a question we could definitely ask. North Carolina, uh, same here. Uh, looks like they've got a market advantage here in North Carolina. So it looks like it's, it's quite possible uh, when you look at this and we look at some of these numbers that uh, you know, it, there might not be that late massive flood uh, unless it involves electioneering, unless it involves, you know, voter fraud, ballot harvesting or something like this. And is that really going to happen? It's difficult to say. A lot of people say it's not likely, but uh, this has been a very strange four years in politics. So we're saying that anything is possible and don't discount any possibility here. So, and this also brings up the specter that we talked about last time, post-election chaos. Are any of these uh, late ballot, late voting states going to be the catalyst that the opposition or the challenging party, the Democrats, are going to use for post-election chaos to say that, uh, you know, we can't uh, call an election winner in this general election because we need to wait to count all the ballots in states like North Carolina, in states like Michigan, in states 
like Pennsylvania, and again, having an Al Franken type situation like we saw in a Minnesota Senate race in 2008, where it just went on and on and on, and it went really into the weeds. And by the end of it, there's allegations of voter fraud uh, in that race as well. So are we going to see that level of chaos? Now, for more on the U.S. 2020 presidential election, uh, we have a special guest with us, George Samuley, a senior fellow at the Global Policy Institute. George, it's a pleasure to have you on Election Edge this week. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So, George, let's get straight on with it. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you see so far? We're only four days out. Uh, do you see anything that's really breaking? Uh, or is this election a, a fait accompli? You know, were all these trends from weeks and months ago, have they already determined the result? Or is there potential here for any last minute changes uh, in terms of Trump versus Biden right now? Is, or is this, is this dead, a dead heat and you just can't call it? Well, I think the media would like us to think that the election is over and that uh, there's really just the small matter of the vote to take place, uh, but otherwise it is already a fait accompli. I think it's very far from the case. Um, I think the polls are very uh, skewed. I think they are very misleading. Um, I do think that it's uh, close. But I think that uh, all of the polls that show uh, Biden uh, ahead by in double digit are, are very foolish. And, um, and, and there's nothing like uh, the way the election is going to turn out. I mean, what, if, if one were to take the polls seriously, then you would have to believe that uh, Biden, probably the weakest candidate any party um, has selected as its nominee in I don't know how many decades, um, is about to uh, win a landslide. It, it, it cannot happen. Um, landslides are very rare, and uh, they usually take place under special circumstances, such as <clears throat> the Great Depression in 1932, um, the, the um, you know, Richard Nixon in 1972, when he was seen to be a very competent and effective president against a, a very weak um, opponent, George McGovern, uh, Ronald Reagan's landslide in 1984. Uh, this was um, a couple of years after the uh, failed assassination attempt, and he, you know, the, the nation kind of fell in love with him for uh, his courage in the face of um, uh, the near-death experience. Um, Otherwise, you know, this is a very divided country. It's a kind of a 50-50 country. And it, it uh, simply beggars belief that uh, the country uh, has uh, decided to uh, go in such a big way for Biden, particularly when you look at other uh, factors um, that clearly show that the, uh, the public is by no means um, so... Um, jaded with Trump and so enamored of uh, Biden. And so one of the things that I was looking at, George, you know, when this, when, when Biden was called as the Democratic nominee, I just thought to myself, you know, are we going to see a rerun of the 2016 election? Because, you know, in my mind, there's not a big difference in, from Hillary Clinton to Joe Biden in terms of policy, in terms of who their Democratic base is, who their support base is. The, you know, the, the demographics are almost identical in terms of support. The only difference really was the gender of the candidate. So the question is, a lot of people said, George, that Hillary Clinton ran the worst presidential election, uh, a campaign in, in living memory in 2016. And so they thought, well, you know, nobody could do that again. You couldn't repeat that feat. And we have a situation there. I'm arguing, I don't know about you, George, but I'm arguing that Joe Biden is potentially, has run a worse campaign than Hillary Clinton ran in, in 2016. So I'm not expecting him to get a better result. So the question is, is the hate for Trump so much that that's going to motivate voters or has Biden really fumbled it? Have the Democrats fumbled it once again? I think so, because uh, as you say, uh, there's a great similarity between uh, Biden and Hillary Clinton. Uh, in both cases, uh, the justification for uh, they, uh, voting them in as the party nominee is that it's basically, it's their turn. It was Clinton's turn. She ran in 2008. 
and uh, therefore it was uh, you know fair deal she should be the uh, the nominee in 2016 biden has uh, run twice before failed twice before he's been in the senate for many years he's been vice president it's kind of his turn you know he's he's punched the clock um so but that's a very bad reason to select uh, a nominee for the, on that basis and historically that's always been uh, a disaster because if you think of uh, when parties make that selection, let's say um, Walter Mondale in 1984, again, he'd been a senator uh, from Minnesota for many years. He'd been Jimmy Carter's uh, vice president. Uh, he, he was a, the consummate insider. He was wiped out in that uh, Reagan landslide. Bob Dole in 96, he'd run before, he'd failed. Uh, he'd been minority leader, he'd been majority leader. It was his turn. Um, and, and I think that uh, the same, uh, and, and he, again, he did an absolutely disastrously um, against um, uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and so I think the Democrats made, made, made the same mistake. They thought that, well, who's the candidate who's most likely to get us over the finish line? Oh, it has to be the consummate insider, the one who is electable. But it never really works that way, um, because somebody who is seen to be electable, who's been around for I don't know how many decades, who really doesn't have too many accomplishments uh, to his or her name, is unlikely to win. I mean, it's usually somebody who is a fresh face, somebody we don't know very much about, either somebody who is... Um, comes from outside Washington, who has been a governor in some state, whether it's somebody Ronald Reagan uh, or uh, Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter, uh, or as in the case of Donald Trump, I mean, he'd been doing other things all his life. Somebody who's, who's a, a fresh face, a fresh voice, um, he's got some kind of a fresh agenda. And that's why uh, Democrats, kind of, as in the case of Hillary Clinton and so with uh, uh, Joe Biden, I've kind of made a devil's pact, thinking that, well, if we select the, the most electable candidate, we're going to do well in the election. It doesn't work that way. Both in 2016 and in 2020, I think they could have gone for Bernie Sanders, uh, and I think Sanders would have done better for them. Uh, but, so what we have had in this campaign is, in fact, a, a rerun of 2016. I mean, Hillary Clinton just vanished. I mean, she decided to uh, coast to victory, believing the polls, uh, believing that all oh, these double-digit leads, these uh, double-digit leads even in the battleground states, would somehow deliver victory for her. Uh, so same with Biden. He thinks that he can just sit at home, uh, drink cocoa, and watch Netflix, and, and then he just win an election. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and uh, <laughs> ultimately, Trump, who is seen to be a phenomenally hard worker, I mean, it's, it, it takes some energy. I mean, his stump speeches are last about an hour and a half. He does three of those a day. That's 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 four and a half hours of uh, standing around speaking. That's a lot of work. I mean, you know, you know about that as yourself, Patrick. Um, and then uh, on Monday night, and he was also in the White House um, for the swearing in of the um, uh, the new uh, Supreme Court justice. He is a hard worker. It just doesn't happen that you know, somebody who's just sitting around in the basement of his house uh, defeats uh, somebody who's just you know running ar around the country uh, fighting like hell to uh, win the White House. So if these two are mirroring each other, 2016 and 2020, what we saw in 2016 was all summer right through September. Hillary Clinton is the odds-on favorite, landslide victory. All the polls were saying exactly the same thing. And then Donald Trump makes the late break right before the beginning of November and then you know, steals the election. Or he's the dark horse, and he comes with the greatest upset in political history. And so really, if you look at how the polls uh, overestimated uh, her favored status right through the whole election cycle, the exact same thing has happened in 2020. But what happened in 2016, George, was that the, uh, the, the, the upset victory was basically blamed on uh, some existential enemy, the Russians in the case of 2016. So they, they set the public up with these great, you know, illustrious poll numbers, double-digit 15-point leads all summer right into the fall for Hillary. 
And then, so the public said, how could she have possibly lost? They must have stole it from her. Are we, are we possibly seeing the same thing happening again? Because there's a number of legal challenges uh, with a number of swing states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, uh, to extend voter uh, uh, deadlines for submissions of ballots. Facebook's weighing in, saying that there's going to be post-election chaos, and they're there to help guide us through it. All sorts of things are going on like this. There seems to be, George, some kind of possibly coordinated effort to uh, litigate this election result through lawfare for weeks after the election. I I is it being set up like this? Do you, are you saying? Are you feeling this? Absolutely, absolutely. Hence, uh, first of all, the drumbeat from uh, political leaders uh, as if the only question that, we, that, that it matters now is, is Donald Trump ready to concede uh, defeat? Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi uh, said this in an interview the other day that, well, Donald Trump uh, has to man up and uh, be ready to concede defeat. In other words, they're kind of raising the expectation that, of course, uh, Trump will lose. Mm. And so therefore, after the election, and Trump hasn't lost, then it must be because he has uh, stolen the election. Similarly with these uh, polls, um, I think that we're getting some really ridiculous numbers that are coming out. Like the other day, ABC News came out with a poll uh, saying that Biden was 17% ahead in Wisconsin. And I think there's going to be many such polls between now and Tuesday, uh, giving Biden some ridiculous leads, you know, leading 15% uh, nationally, so that when Biden fails to win, then uh, there'll be the declaration that clearly uh, there's been this election has been uh, stolen. Uh, now, are they, are they going to blame Russia? Maybe. Are they going to blame the October surprise in the New York Post? Uh, maybe. Or uh, are they just simply going to say Trump um, has clearly, um, uh, you know, stolen the election? I mean, we, you know, we had um, Michael Moore uh, the other day giving an interview on uh, Rising, uh, in which he said they're just simply going to uh, steal the uh, the ballot boxes, so they, that uh, you know, the, the polling, you know, the polling machines. They're just going to steal them, and that's and that's all that's going to, uh, you know, that and that therefore any result other than a decisive Trump defeat will be interpreted as some kind of uh, theft on the part of Trump. And I think that's very important. This is really being set up now that it's a done deal. Uh, Trump has uh, lost the election. And then any other result but that means that some some kind of uh, uh, theft on the part of Trump has taken place. And what you said is right about that, that we're now getting set for um, what happens on election day. And and uh, and then Facebook uh, will be um, censoring uh, any uh, statements or any suggestions that uh, Trump has won the election. I mean, it's not they're not saying that they're going to do anything about uh, statements from the Democrats that they've won. It's any any statements on the part of Trump uh, that he has won the election that they're going to censor. So clearly, you know, uh, we're being set up for a situation in which. Uh, and, and we've seen this, these are like the color revolutions elsewhere, uh, whether it was in Yugoslavia in 2000 or in Georgia, or U Ukraine twice, uh, which is that, you know, an, a, a certain election outcome is predicted. And if it doesn't happen, it means that the election has been stolen. And therefore, everybody must come out into the streets, um, protest, riot, uh, cause violence, because there is this public rage that um, the election has been stolen. And, clear, and this is what is happening now. And it's, a, and it's a quite a serious situation. And you know, I, I, you know, I would bet if anything that in the next few days, we're going to have loony polls uh, showing Trump you know, way, way behind in order to have the, um, as essentially the election to be a foregone conclusion. No, absolutely. I think the words Mark Zuckerberg used was, if anybody's claiming uh, an election result before a consensus can be made. So I'm guessing yeah. who's going to be giving that consensus? Mainstream media, right. ma mainstream organizations, the DNC, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, etc. Right. They're going to build a wall of propaganda, uh, much like we saw with Russiagate uh, over the yes. years. So, uh, but the other question I want to ask you, two quick questions, George. Do you, A, uh, do you think lockdown uh, and COVID has become a wedge issue 
in 2020, a new kind of temporary wedge issue that might be sort of helping one candidate or another break in certain uh, states under certain demographics and so forth? That's the first question. The second question is, do you think that the down ballot races, uh, we're really looking at the U.S. Senate here, uh, do you think the Democrats have a, a, a real chance to, to challenge there? Just a, a quick answer on both of those. I, I think that the, uh, the lockdown and COVID have been uh, wedge issues. Um, the, I mean, you can see how the Democrats have run with this issue. This is their issue. Um, back in uh, 2016, uh, they were running against Trump and Putin. Uh, now uh, they're running against Trump and COVID. And that's, that's really the, the, the one message they have, COVID, 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 COVID. Uh, and and what, is, what is Biden's uh, program? Make mandatory mask wearing, um, and, and so that that's what they're saying. You know that here we are. Uh, Trump has killed, uh, and you know, all the, the 225,000 deaths are all on Trump. He he murdered all these people. It's a bizarre claim, but that's what they're running on. Um, the lockdown is a, is a, is an interesting one because, of course, uh, if the Democrats uh, succeed with that, and they've persuaded the public that. Um, uh, that, that Trump is indeed to blame for these 225,000 deaths, then, of course, uh, well, we're going to have the lockdowns. I mean, I, I would find it very surprising that the public wants lockdowns. They, they want to be driven out of business. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, countless small businesses uh, going bankrupt, uh, people out of work, and, and all the awful social consequences of lockdowns. Uh, but that's obviously the uh, the consequence of uh, the Democrats' um uh, the policy. And that's for your second question about the uh, the down ballot races. Again, uh, if the Democrats do quite poorly, considerably poorer than the polls are predicting, which which is what I think, uh, then I think this will affect the, the down ballot races. And it may well be that uh, senators who we thought would get beaten uh, may well survive. I'm thinking of uh, Susan Collins. I think she may well survive. Um, I think Lindsey Graham may well survive. Um, the, um, the, the, the Cory Gardner in Colorado may, may survive. I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, that you know that the Republicans either control the Senate or it's a kind of a 50-50 um, uh, tie. But 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 I, I, I certainly don't think at, at this stage that um, uh, the, the Democrats will uh, capture the Senate. Well, if, if the Republicans don't keep the Senate, it's going to be the year of impeachment once again. Uh, it definitely will be. Yeah, that, 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 yeah absolutely. If, if Pelosi uh, con continues with her control of the House, and I suspect that she will be, and Trump is reelected, there will be another impeachment next year. I mean, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's guaranteed, no question. And, and vice versa, if Biden wins and the Republicans keep the Senate. Right, exactly. That, that, that's right. You know, pay, pay, payback is, uh, is sweet. <laughs> anyway, we want to thank you for your time, uh, George. Uh, sure. And, you know, we've got a big, big four days coming up over the weekend. So uh, enjoy the play-by-play. -play. Hopefully we'll be able to check in with you uh, later on, closer to the election day. Good. Thanks very much, Patrick. Really fantastic segment by George Samuel. Thanks, George. Now, this means we're probably going to have to revisit again our electoral map. And as you can see, we've made a few changes uh, from the last program. We thought that the Republicans might be breaking in New Mexico. It turns out that that might not actually materialize. So we've revised our uh, electoral count, and this is what we have. This is our scenario for election votes uh, right now as it stands. Donald Trump, Joe Biden. We have Donald J. Trump at 314 electoral votes. And we have Joe Biden at 224. Now, this is based on statistics. This is based on trends. This is based on momentum that we're seeing in key areas. So again, this could change. Uh, it could swing in either way, possibly in the next four days. Stranger things have happened in the history of electoral politics in the United States. So we'll see. But at the moment, this is what we're looking at. And this is really based on key battleground states where we think that the Republicans, the GOP, are definitely moving uh, and have the momentum in those key states. So that's where we're at right now. And uh, we're going to wrap it up uh, for this episode. But we want to direct everybody to check out our electoral blog, our live blog.
Election Edge at 21stCenturyWire.com. Go there and check out any breaking tips. You'll see uh, tips by Basil Valentine. I'll be there live blogging as well and other contributors. So go there for your breaking news and any interesting things that, that you might not be getting in your regular media coverage. So hopefully we'll check back in a few days and it will just be uh, really four days until the elections. It's unbelievable. So the big day is coming up. The grudge match is nearly here. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll hopefully check back with you in the next 24 hours with another update. But uh, take care.